Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, we, my guest today is uh, Professor Stephen Chu. Uh, Steve is the William R. Kennan Jr. Professor of Physics of Molecular and Cellul Cellular Physiology and of Energy Science and Engineering uh, here at Stanford. He has published hundreds of papers in physics, biophysics, biology, bioimaging, and other energy technologies. And he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the American Academy of, of Arts and Sciences. Professor Chu received the 1997 Nobel Prize in Physics for the development of methods to cool and trap atoms with laser light and for demonstrating the possibility for the design of more precise atomic clocks to use in, for example, space navigation and accurate determination of position. But uh, it feels like the Nobel Prize was only the beginning of Steve's uh, career. Uh, since 2000, he has devoted much of his scientific career to the search of new solutions to our energy and climate challenges. Uh, and Steve was appointed the 12th uh, US Secretary of Energy from 2009 to 2013 under President Obama. Uh, as the first scientist to hold a cabinet position, Steve recruited outstanding scientists and engineers into the Department of Energy. He began several initiatives, including the Energy Innovation Hubs and the Clean Energy Ministerial Meetings. Uh, during this time, Steve was also personally tasked by President Obama to help stop the BP oil leak. So thank you very much, Steve, for, for being here. You're welcome. Thank you. So I, I want to start by taking you back to the end of April 2010, maybe it was uh, the beginning of May. Uh, you are the energy secretary of President Obama, and there is a disaster off uh, of the coast of the U.S. in the Gulf of Mexico, which later became known as the BP oil spill, the largest marine oil spill in the history of the petroleum industry. And at some point, uh, President Obama comes to you and says something like, Chu, go down there and help them stop the oil leak. So I want to start with asking you, what did you do? And, uh, and maybe uh, you can remind those in the audience who were too young to remember uh, how big of a disaster this, this really was. Okay, so um, it was a very bad disaster. Uh, for those of you, 2010, there was an oil exploration drilling rig that was, had been in a hurry and it caught fire, it exploded, it drifted away, and after a few days, it sank. Uh, it was drilling one mile deep in the Gulf of Mexico, and, and this pipe stretched like a rubber band uh, to a mile and a half. And the ship sank, the rubber band snapped, and uh, oil started gushing out. We didn't know how much, but later it was about 50,000 barrels a day, um, uh, 50 times worse than Exxon Valdez, except it was, looked like it could continue for months. And so uh, for those of you who do remember, it, they had a little inset on CNN 24-7 that showed oil and gas gushing out of this. And this, needless to say, put a lot of tension uh, uh, for not only BP, but uh, the administration and everybody uh, who, who's around this area in, in the Gulf Coast. So the president heard I had made a suggestion to BP, a technical suggestion using gamma rays to figure out what was going on with this so-called blowout prevention platform. It's, a, it's something as tall as uh, this from the floor to the ceiling of huge valves, gushing oil, and they didn't know what the state of the oil is. So I said, okay, maybe you can use gamma rays like x-rays and go through a few inches of steel. You can figure out what's going on. The people at BP laughed and said, oh, Chu, he's from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. That's where the Hulk was formed. And for those of you who don't know, the Hulk was irradiated with gamma rays and became the Hulk. So they made a joke about it. And then a day later, they said, you know, he may be right. And then two days later, he said, it could work. And then three days later, he said, it's commercial. <laughs> uh, 
anyway, somehow, I didn't tell the president, but somehow he heard about it. And at the end of a cabinet meeting, the next cabinet meeting, early May, he says, literally, chew, go down there and help them stop the leak. He didn't mean form a committee. He meant you as an active scientist, fix it. So I said, oh, OK, how do I do that? Well, I didn't know anything about petroleum engineering, things like that. So I thought I'd get some of the really out-of-the-box thinkers, a half a dozen you know, crazies who would have to come up with new ideas, because we're off the manual. And um, so I said, OK, I was thinking of who to get, asked a few people, then called them up and said, you know, we have a national emergency. Would you be willing to go down there and help me figure out how we can help BP? And a half dozen, everyone said yes. Uh, sometimes they said, well, let me check with my department head, but, you know, <laughs> because I'm teaching. So, or someone said, let me check with my spouse, uh, or things like that. Everyone said yes. And I also said, oh, by the way, first meeting, 8 AM, Houston tomorrow. So. I'm going to fast forward two weeks. Imagine we're in the control room at 2 AM in the morning. BP had hooked up some, and they're going to s stick some stuff on the top. The oil and gas is gushing out. So they're going to have these bypass valves. They're going to stick stuff. Stuff is like s sponges, golf balls, junk, uh, one by one, and see if they can plug the leak with this stuff. But we had a plan that we do this, and then OK, if that didn't work, take measurements of what the pressure drop was across this big sack and do it. So they did one thing, didn't work. They immediately did the other thing. And I said, wait a minute. We had a plan. We were going to take measurements of the pressures. You got to do this. And what I didn't say is, you do this, or I'm calling up the President of the United States. You can do this as a direct report. Cabinet members are direct reports to the president. So you get on the phone and say, I want to talk to the president. You know, like, I want to talk to my boss. <laughs> and um, so I got very mad at 2 AM. Thad Walker was there at that hour. And he said, fine. And the BP is, OK, we'll do it. It was taking those measurements that actually led to the possibility that we could stop the leak. But after this experience with BP that these guys were going to rush ahead in desperation, try anything, but not think things through, I thought, maybe, maybe before they do anything else, I need a written plan, and I would have to approve it. My little group. It wasn't a committee. It was a little group of six people. We discussed things. And I said, don't worry. No votes taken. We're going to discuss, and I'll decide. It's the decisions on me. So I suggested I was going to do this to my group. And one of them, two of them said, don't do this. You, you ask, you're going to give approval. That means you're going to own it. You're going to partially own what happens. And I said, well, we're going to make decisions based on the best knowledge we have. If things go wrong, and they might, I'll certainly be fired. But it's better to do it this way than to not do anything or to hide behind a committee. Right. So, so that's, that's kind of like what I, what I, what I read the, at the time that you, the documents and this, and exactly that's the impression that I got, that uh, you felt like you approached this crisis like a, like a scientist and you are like uh, committed to rely on the best available evidence and willing to take the full responsibility if it didn't actually, if it didn't actually work out, so so what, what was your kind of like your thought process, and were you really uh, willing to at the time to take the responsibility of the whole, you know, like uh, of the whole thing if it didn't work out, and that's how you did it? Well, I think good leaders, the best leaders, do that. They make the best decision at the time. They don't hide behind lawyers or bureaucrats or committees, and they just say. Uh, that's what's going to have to be done. And for me, you know, I could get fired. But I thought, well, I, I can go find another job. <laughs> and but it's, uh, but more like the, 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 you know, hundreds of gallons a day are poured yeah. into the, I remember, I remember the, 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 the CNN, I remember the, 
seeing this like on, in the ocean, it was a disaster. Like, uh, and so weren't the engineers also committed? Like, to, so how, what was the? There was like a debate of sort, like of what was the best uh, way to solve this. And and you were very convinced because uh, of the scientific evidence appeared to be on your side. Is that was that? The well, it, it's it's more complicated. But let me give you an example. Yeah. This oil well blows up, and so the pressure there is a big fear that the pressure from the explosion of the oil well, it's one mile deep and then another mile and a half into the rock. Yeah. And that it would blown out, the, these are big steel cylinders, double layered, right. and it would have blown this stuff out. So if you plugged it from the top and the well was damaged, then that oil and gas would leak out in the rock, find its way to the surface, erode its way to the surface, and until the pressure was equal, uh, one mile deep, it would empty the entire reservoir, which was uh, about 100 times more than did leak out. So, so it was, and so the BP engineer said, no, no, we th we're convinced the well's damaged. I said, no, I don't think so. Let's go over the evidence. They went away. They came back the next day. I was living in Houston by that time, uh, half time. I said, you know, you may be right. It might not be damaged. So it left some options open, and it was the real. And finally, it turned out it wasn't damaged. Uh, but then we, you know, over weeks and weeks, we would sort through these things. And again, this was something that, after a few weeks, the BP engineers decided we weren't there to do anything except stop the leak. Yep. We weren't talking to anybody. No press. No nothing. And so there was no, nothing leaking out. We're, we're not trying to assign blame. We're not trying to do anything. We just want to stop the leak. And they became convinced of that. And then they became convinced we were very helpful. <laughs> so, so what did you learn from this experience as a policymaker and as a, as a scholar? Well, uh, I'll tell you, no other bureaucrat I know in DC would ever say, I'm going to make the right decision. And if, if it's wrong and they fire me, it's the best thing to do. They don't think that way <laughs> uh, because they want to get reelected. Um, so now this was different because I never did politics. Uh, Obama didn't know me when he started to try to, you know, he kind of in, wanted to interview me and wanted to recruit me the second week after the election in November 2008. And um, and he had confidence. I was a practicing scientist, not a former scientist. And he treated me like a practicing scientist. And so in this, in Makano oil and other things, he, he just said, you as a scientist, do this, which is remarkable. And he had confidence in me, and he would protect my back. So all the political people that hover around presidents, <laughs> Uh, who are worried about polls and worry about things and worry about perceptions in the press. I knew that the president um, had confidence in me, so every decision I made in the Department of Energy was actually devoid of politics, which is extremely unusual. I would say never happened before or since uh, that, that um, uh, they had someone who didn't care about politics, didn't want to rise up in the ranks of anything, and just want to go back to Stanford after it's all over. So let, let's talk a bit about your award-winning research. So the Nobel Committee mentioned uh, the development of methods to cool and trap atoms with laser light, as well as demonstrating the possibility for the design of more precise atomic clock for the use in space navigation and accurate determination of position. So even reading this paragraph, I have to say, I have a couple questions. <laughs> so first, you know, what, what is an atomic clock? An atomic clock is using atoms. These are isolated atoms in vacuum where they're not bouncing against things and they have very precise energy levels. And so what you do is you slave a laser or microwave source to these very precise energy levels, and then that then you read out what the frequency is from that microwave source. And so it doesn't sound, you, know, so you might think, uh, this is a Nobel Prize. Well, actually, it was one in a series of about four or five different Nobel Prizes of different improvements on atomic clocks. 
And so then you think, well, you give four or five different Nobel Prizes for better clocks? How does that make sense? Well, there's about two dozen Nobel Prizes that use these better clocks to push back the frontiers of science. And so in that respect, it was a, in a long line of traditions of these things. So, so what do we use atomic clocks for? Uh, you mentioned this in your introduction. Um, I think all of you use global positioning satellite systems for navigation, for finding out where you are, things like that. It also, those, the basis of that are atomic clocks and satellites in space. And the improvement of atomic clocks for satellites in space means that the global positioning satellite system, you said we don't need the five or six digits that were added, but you do because it makes it more secure so that it's more immune to interference from, from you know, foreign adversaries. Right. Uh, so, so there are things like that where atomic clocks form the basis. The reason it forms the basis of the most precise measurements in all of science is because we can count better than we can do anything else. Count is count frequency. And, um, and then any small effect that shifts the frequency, we can measure. So, so then how is the, the trapping and the cooling of atoms and, and using laser light related yeah. to that? Yeah. yeah, right. So these atoms are cold. Uh, instead of the speed of supersonic jet planes, they, if you put them in a vacuum chamber, and we learned how to hold them, but if you turned it off, they would drop like rocks to the bottom of the chamber. They don't go pfft. They just go boom. So I said, oh, if they can do like that, we can toss them up. So they toss them up, turn around due to gravity. It takes about a second. The time of going up and coming down, that time of one second, increased the time you can make the measurement, and hence the accuracy of the measurement, which is proportional to the time you can make the measurement. So we went from milliseconds to seconds. And immediately, in the very first, within seven years after we tossed the atoms up and showed this worked, it became the time standard uh, of the world. It's the fastest adaptation of technology I've ever seen. Uh, because it was so obvious it was going to be so much better. And, and are there other reasons to trap atoms besides this application for this, you know, for the space navigation? There are. Uh, another thing that we showed at Stanford when I came here was you can take an atom and you can use a quantum mechanical trick to separate them. So an atom is here and an atom is here at the same time. And so the atom goes up, it's in both places at once, and you can use the quantum mechanical interference. Turns out that this way is the most sensitive way of measuring gravity, which is used for oil prospecting, it's used for lots of things. Uh, but it's used, again, in the it's going to be the best way of measuring gravity waves that we know about is being built now at Fermilab. And so crazy stuff that we didn't anticipate in 1992 when we first did that, that this method is getting 10, 12 digits on the measurement of gravity. Oh, by the way, the, uh, the accuracy, the precision of clocks are now at 21 decimal places. Okay, let me tell you what 21 decimal places means. Universe, 13 billion years old. That means you know what time it is, if you start one of these clocks then, to less than a thousandth of one second. And believe it or not, that is not overkill. <laughs> <laughs> because it is the basis of the most precise measurements. You, you have devoted much of your academic career and much of your time at the White House to the search for new solutions to our energy and climate challenges. So when President Obama thanked you for your service, he said, during his time as secretary, Steve helped my administration move America towards real energy independence. Over the past four years, we have doubled the use of renewable energy, dramatically reduced our dependence on foreign oil, and put our country on a path to win the global race for clean energy jobs. So what do you consider the main progress we have made on climate change and renewable energy? And what do you see as the main challenges that still remain? OK, so it turns out that one of the most successful things I did was the thing I was most criticized for. Um, 
uh, when I took over in the Department of Energy, the career people said we we're going to start making guaranteed loans to innovative companies, and they picked as the first company a company that Wall Street Journal said in 2009 that this is one of the top 25 com companies to watch. It was a solar cell company called Solyndra. And we lost a half a billion dollars, to be exact, uh, $560 million. And uh, it became political fodder that they thought we were did this because there were political crimes. It turned out that there were Democrats and Republicans who were investors in this company. But it doesn't matter. It was the perception that it was a Democratic boondoggle that was the ammunition. So for the next uh, four years, they just constantly tried to criticize Obama and me about this. But what now, in the end, when I left, that program actually made money. We had this huge loss in Solyndra, a little over half a billion. We uh, had a loss in Fisker of 200 million, but we made money because we made big loans, half a billion dollar loans to solar projects and wind projects that Wall Street would not finance because at half a billion dollars, you're late in these projects, you're, you're hosed, we're not gonna touch this. But we would only make a loan of an existing technology that could scale up, that had off-take agreements. It says, you build this project on budget on time, you're gonna sell it for a certain amount uh, to utility companies. And virtually all of those came in the black. We made a loan to Tesla. We announced it in February 2009. February 2009, Tesla could no longer make payroll. They were going to fold within one month. So we announced the loan and allowed them to continue. And the initial investors, half of them bailed and the other half stayed because they were, we were going to, you know, we were going to, it was about a half a billion also. So they developed the S1, now the S car, with that money. We made a loan to Nissan to develop the Leaf. We made loans like that. <clears throat> and Tesla and Nissan and Ford, oh, Ford, GM and Chrysler went bankrupt. Ford was in the edge of bankruptcy. They, you know, that Ford medallion, that oval blue thing that says Ford, they hocked it. <laughs> you know, just in case we go under, you, you know, it's like a pawn shop, you know, we got a couple hundred million dollars, you can use the symbol and the medallion if we disappear. <laughs> but they bought it back. Uh, and, and Tesla paid back the loan early um, only because they were slipping schedule again. So I had to call up Elon Musk and say, Elon, I've got a call in the loan, so why don't you pay us back? But we're going to give you a break. We took his collateral warrants, so that's the ability to buy Tesla stock at a certain price. The warrants were $80, the price was 400. And we own 300,000 shares, so you do the math and it's a couple billion bucks. So if we cashed in our warrants, you won't have enough cash to finish the S1, even if you fundraise for another two billion, which they needed. So we'll give you a break, we'll maybe take a half a billion. And so we saved Tesla twice. <laughs> Uh, they then raised the money. They finished the S. They came up with the uh, three, which is, you know, and then the X, and now the Y, so it spells sexy. Uh, and then, just so you know, the Cybertruck is C. They have two more. It's, it's, there's going to be sexy car. <laughs> so they got two more models, <laughs> just so you're prepared. <laughs> but... Um, but it was things like that where, you know, it's true that uh, Tesla made electric vehicles sexy. And uh, this is fascinating. And uh, so looking at it from today, you know, like after spending the time there and coming back to, the, to your research, what, what do you advocate for today regarding climate change and renewable energy? And, and what do you think is our path forward as, as a society with, with this? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, things are good. Uh, you know, the renewable energy has gotten a lot cheaper. And many of you have probably heard in terms of the levelized cost of wind and solar, it's 
competitive with natural gas today. Natural gas in the United States, which is some of the cheapest natural gas in the entire world. But that's not the full story, because if you're 20% wind and solar, then you have all the other systems to back you up. If you're 70% wind and solar, you, part of the cost of wind and solar is the backup power, the transmission lines, the energy storage of any kind, whether it's batteries or hydro or whatever. And so it's got to get twice as cheap in order to be really competitive with natural gas. And the good news is it will get there. The bad news is that we need to do all these other things, like transmission lines. And so people don't like transmission lines. And so, but if you don't have transmission lines, you've got a problem. But that's the easy stuff. Oh, by the way, electric vehicles, uh, you know, they're going to be 50% of the market by 2030, by 2040, 2050. They may be 80% of the market all over the world. Sounds great. That's the light vehicles. But, uh, and they will, because within a decade, they're going to be as inexpensive as internal combustion engine cars without subsidy. And that's pretty reliable. Well, I'm on board of a battery company. I do battery research. And the batteries are getting better and better, cheaper and cheaper. All good stuff. Let me tell you about stuff we don't have solutions for. About a quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions is from food production and food waste, mostly food production. This is f food for you know methane from cows, for example. But it's actually emissions from fertilizer, nitrous oxide. And we're using more and more fertilizer around the world, as we must, because we're a world of 8 billion people. Organics only for very rich people in rich countries. Uh, but in the developing world, without fertilizer, they would starve to death. But the use of fertilizer makes a very potent greenhouse gas that's 200 times worse than carbon dioxide and stays in the atmosphere for over 100 years. It's a disaster. We don't know how to stop using fertilizer, and we don't know how to stop the greenhouse gas emissions from the use of fertilizer yet. I'm devoting some of my time and attention to trying to figure this out, but we don't know that. And remember, Greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture is more than electricity generation around the world. Okay, it's more greenhouse gas than electricity. And so, so there are things that we haven't figured out. And so the path to zero emissions by 2050 will have to mean we've figured this out and we've deployed it and most of the farmers around the world now use it. So that's a challenge. Now, you, of course, have had much success in, in your career, but if you don't mind sharing with us, uh, can you tell us about a, a project of yours that, that failed, actually? Oh, I have a, a whole bunch of things that fail. Um, so let me just start by saying, you know, people have asked me when I was at Bell Labs in Stanford, everything seems to work, and what's going on, and what's your magic? And I said, no, no, one in ten work. I just fail really fast. <laughs> and quickly, you fail fast and quickly, and then you move on. So I learned to fail by in weeks or months rather than years. And that's everybody will tell you that's the secret. Uh, you know, more shots on goal uh, in your vicinity, and you will get more scores. So, so uh, you know, one of the one of the worst things was actually the thing I get the Nobel Prize for. I did this experiment, and I measured the temperature, and it was guided by theory. I said, oh, the temperature could be a little bit colder than absolute minimum by theory, but it's around there, so I made these big air bars. And a couple of years later, as people repeated the work, and they did more careful measurements, they said, oops, the temperature's like 10 times lower. So I said, oh my gosh, went back. Yes, repeated that what they did. Two, two, three other groups rapidly said, it's 10 times lower. What's going on? And, um, and then I, and then independently, a French group, Claude Condon and Jean Dalibar, figured out the real theory. Uh, but that was a big failure because I was too guided by theory. I just, just said, just what does the measurement say? So I 
to this day, I'm kicking myself <laughs> <laughs> that uh, uh, don't listen too much to theory. Listen to your experiment. Listen to nature. And I'm fond of saying, and when nature talks, listen. Nice. What led you to study physics to begin with? Why did I study physics? Um, because I was really bad at memorizing things. And biology and chemistry needed a lot of memory <laughs> uh, compared to physics. Uh, and I had a great high school physics teacher as a junior, as a senior. He won national prizes. And he took me under his wing, and, and that was good. Um, but the major thing I love physics is that you can have very simple things, assumptions. You can go in the lab and test them and see if it works or not. If it doesn't work, you've got to modify your thinking. If it does work, fine. It's the basis for something. And then you build on it and build on it. And it uses mathematics, so there's no hand-waving. And so in that respect, over four or 500 years, physics became this mainstay of what we rely on. It's, you know, there, there are certain laws in physics. Now, Newton's laws were superseded by special relativity, which was superseded by general relativity. But in the domain where Newton's laws were tested experimentally, still works. We still design airplanes using Newton's laws. We don't use quantum mechanics to design airplanes. But quantum mechanics also supplanted uh, so, so what does these theories grow by saying the basis is still there, and then you add deeper understandings? So I love that, um, and it's not going to be I, what attracted me is it's not going to be overthrown by fashion or this or that. It's just it, the final arbitrator is experiment. And it always seems like you know I, I just I, I, when I read all your your things in preparing this this conversation, it was kind of incredible how much like curiosity driven you are. So like in '97 you win the Nobel Prize. It was 25 years ago, and then it looks like you completely switched at least from the outside. It looks like you completely switched your research agenda to study climate change. And, uh, and I kind of wanted you to walk us through this process. Like, what led you to you know, switch topics to, to climate change after you won the Nobel Prize? Well, before I won the Nobel Prize, in the early 90s, when I was at Bell Labs, we did the first laser cooling trapping. And then Art Ashkin discovered you, the same method that we found you can hold on to particles as well as atoms, you, he can hold on to bacteria. And so he started holding doing experiments holding on to bacteria and messing around with them. And I said, OK, we can hold on to atoms. We can hold on to bacteria. Well, can we hold on to individuals, one molecule, one biomolecule, and measure what it does? So when I came to Stanford in 87, I said, this, I want to do this. I told them this when I left uh, Bell Labs. And in 91, 92, we succeeded, holding on to a single molecule with an optical tweezer and watch what it does and measure what it does. So I was into biology in the early 90s. And by the Nobel Prize, I was maybe two thirds of my group was doing biology and polymer science, not the stuff I got the Nobel Prize for, you know, Adams, Cox, and stuff. So, so I had already switched. And so then what happened was around 2000, I was just an ordinary citizen reading newspapers, minding my own business, and you know, I was beginning to say, you know, this climate change stuff, they may have a point. So I just started reading articles, right? first newspaper articles, then original articles. And then I, think, and I started to talk about it. I said, you know, whether it's true or not, there's enough there that, and so I started talking about it. And um, by the year 2004, um, a Berkeley lab, my old haunt, um, U University of California, Berkeley. I was a graduate student, a postdoc, and a starting assistant professor there before I went to Bell Labs. They wanted me to become the director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I said, I'm not interested. I'm happy at Stanford. I'm going to, you know, I don't want to be a bureaucrat. And they asked me again. I said, no. And it turns out you have to say no three times. It's in the Bible. <laughs> and then they leave you alone. But this, after the second time, I said, well, I'm giving talks about climate change. And here's this wonderful Department of Energy National Lab right next to Berkeley, where I was a member when I was a graduate student postdoc, a faculty member. 
And they trained maybe three dozen young career scientists who went on to get Nobel Prizes. And they had 15, well, at that time, 10 Nobel laureates who worked at the lab and throughout their history. So their training of Nobel, future Nobel laureates is actually a better track record than Stanford. <laughs> and so I said, if I'm talking about climate change, and if I go to a national lab and get some of these people interested in thinking about solutions, that could be a lot better than giving a bunch of talks. So I said, OK, OK, uh, I'll consider it. Um, and uh, so I went for an interview. And then that afternoon, after the interview, they said, the job is yours if you want it. And let me tell you something else uh, that once you go for an interview, they say if, you, if there are some conditions or whatever, and they're going to be met, then you take the job. You do not turn around and go back to your dean or your president of your university and said, Berkeley really likes me and wants me. You want to give me a couple hundred million dollars more for my <laughs> research? <laughs> uh, and so uh, I don't believe in that. Uh, and, and so I said, and, you know, the salaries are going to match my salary, and it, it so didn't matter. And so, so I took the job and started talking about it. And, and it, in fact, when I got there, this is very funny. Some of my colleagues at Berkeley and Berkeley Labs said, Steve, we don't know a thing about energy. And I said, neither do I. We're going to teach ourselves. Long before it became fashionable and there was a lot of money, we started to teach ourselves, what can we do to help solve the problem? And uh, it was great because we taught ourselves and people started shifting careers. And, and uh, that intellectual horsepower in 2004 to 2008, as you begin to see this shift, you said, OK, if you get the, some of the smartest people in the world to think about this, we're going to get there much faster. Now, another thing I discovered that there is that we share a love for history. In our little conversation in your office, you, your eye, eyes brightened when you talked about uh, the, the history of the last million years from the perspective of climate change. Uh, uh, do you want to tell us a bit of uh, why you think history is so important and how do you view the, what we can learn from history about the current challenges that we have today? Well, I love history. Even when I was in high school, I loved history. And when I taught physics classes, I teach a lot about the history of how people actually came to these discoveries. And it's not some sterile thing that's distilled into textbooks. But in terms of the history of climate change, there's a few things that I would like to share with you. If you think about what we need in order to change entire infrastructures of everything, agriculture, transportation, electricity generation, you name it, everything. Uh, and you ask yourself, how fast can we make this transition? Because if it, if it extends over 100 years, we'll be in deep trouble. But it, can we make it in 20 or 30 years? And what are, what are the hang-ups? And so I look back in the history, even starting when I was in the Department of Energy, and said, what's the fastest technological change? Turns out, one of the fastest was the transition from horses to automobiles. About 20, 25 years, you went from mostly horses to mostly cars in the United States. Unbelievable, OK? Um, but that was the fastest. Uh, and it was actually, ironically, driven by a pollution problem. Climate change is a pollution problem. The horses pollution problem was much more visible. Uh, there were millions of pounds of horse manure piling up in New York City every day. So you could see it, you could smell it, and you had to walk in it. And then all of a sudden, along comes a poopless carriage. <laughs> and so that's where it went. And so all the cities just went like a flash, no more horses, no more horse poop. Only If only carbon dioxide were as visible, <laughs> uh, we could go much faster. Uh, but, but if you look at the history of the technologies and how fast they change, it took, typically it takes a half a century. And what drives it is actually free market draws. 
And so we have another problem. There's, there is no free market economy for s stopping pollution yet. Tell, tell me more about that. What do you have, mean by that? Well, okay, so uh, you make cars, you make airplanes, you make this, you make that, uh, you can make a profit. So businesses go in. Um, if you are spewing carbon dioxide in the air uh, and there's no financial penalty for doing that, uh, there will be no market. There, it, unless you pay someone, let's say, $100 a ton to capture carbon dioxide or $60 a ton, they're not going to do it. There's just stuff in the air. Or a penalty. Water pollution was that way. It was a penalty, right? Because, and, and just to remind you, again, it's history. It's my former post I calling me up. Um, in it, the EPA was started, Environmental Protection Agency was started in 1974 under Nixon. And what was the last straw was the Ohio River caught fire for the fourth time. It, it was so polluted with junk and oil debris that it caught fire. And then people said enough is enough. <laughs> and and so, so there started to be penalties for dumping crap in the river. <laughs> and then they were enforced. And so there has to be something like that, or at least a price that prevents you from just throwing stuff in the atmosphere. And so finally, before I open this up to questions uh, from, from the audience, uh, what advice do you have for, you know, for, the, for students who are inspired by, by this and want to pursue physics or climate change? Uh, what advice and tips do you have for them? Well, um, first of all, what I sense at Stanford and everywhere else is that there's now um, a generation of students who are getting very much more committed to many things, environmental things, sustainability, social justice, all these good things. And this is something I'm very excited about. Uh, when I was growing up in your age, it was... I, it was in the 60s, uh, and, and there, was, there was a feeling there among the generation there, and there was the middle generations where people got very rich, um, but, uh, or wanted to get very rich. But, but I think uh, many of the people, the young people today, really want to do good things. So what can you do? It depends on what you're talented at. If you have scientific and mathematical ability, I would say first learn physics because you got to learn it young. It's, you can't learn mathematics when you're 40 or 30. So you start when you're a teenager in 20s. Uh, but if you're not good at mathematics, that's OK. You know, if you want economics, political science, all of these things. Because it's not just going to be inventions in technology. It's also going to be innovations in public policy that will be needed to change the track we're on. And so all those other fields will be useful. And because it's, it's going to take not only a village, it's going to take all the villages uh, to do this. And so, so I think you know, I would encourage you to keep your idealism, to talk to your faculty members or other mentors about where you can find jobs afterward. Uh, and it's up to the rest of us to figure out that you guys are going to be employable, and you're going to <laughs> and you don't have to live in your parents' home for the next twenty years. Uh, um, and so I think so. My advice is, you know, keep your idealism, and uh, and with your idealism, and also tell your parents and grandparents to don't leave the world in the shape that they're in the process of leaving it. And it's their responsibility to actually do something because they're older and they're in positions to do something about it more than you if you're you know, an undergraduate at Stanford. So anyway, so with that, I would say uh, you know, keep up the good work. Steve, thank you so much. So the, the floor is open to questions. And, uh, and Jenna and Tamri here are going to walk with microphones and, and take your questions. 
uh, uh, thank you for the talk. As a fellow physicist, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, if you look at the solar panels and the batteries, you can have lots of them, you can solve the climate issue. Since the batteries are basically thin films on either aluminum or copper, solar cells are either on thin films and copper, not copper, glass or you know, silicon. So all we have to do is uh, make perfect thin film deposition, which is our expertise in this country, right? So we get 100% materialization of all this stuff. So what do you think about that? that? I've been working on that for 18 years, you know, mm -hmm. just say uh, I want the perfect uh, deposition technology. Yeah. So let me rephrase the question, comment and question that if you look at batteries, you look at solar cells, they're all based on thin films. And uh, physicists and material scientists uh, are you know, experts in thin films. Uh, and therefore, this is the key to making better batteries in solar cells. And the short answer is I agree with you. Uh, in fact, in my current research, I'm working on nanometer thick thin films that could make it possible to make uh, double the energy density of lithium ion batteries using, and it's got to be cheap. Uh, uh, but I'm, we're talking about, you know, like 10 atomic layers. Uh, you know, applied materials that makes the machines that makes the highest integrated circuits are thinking of single atomic layers of graphene separated by single atomic layers of hexane and board for electrical context. So, so this is going everywhere that this uh, going from three-dimensional to two-dimensional geometries of, of really atomic layers is one of the frontiers of physics, and it is already uh, leaking into batteries and solar uh, cells. Uh, uh, first off, thank you for a great lecture. I think earlier on you were hinting at carbon tax. Um, I wanted to ask how you see that implemented, and specifically how we can make that equitable for countries who are currently experiencing an industrial revolution and after we already have. Well, yes, I was hinting at, a, at carbon tax, some way to price carbon, to, to price the emissions, because um, you've got to, you, you, and the way you think about it is there is a social cost of emitting, you know, polluting waters, polluting air, uh, locally and polluting air globally, and CO2, uh, there is a social cost. The debate is what is the social cost? Uh, it's now $40, $60 a ton. Uh, the EPA wants to make it $100 a ton, uh, but what will make a difference? What cost? If so, from what I know about how it would shape industry, once you're at $100 a ton and you know that the price will stay there, it's not going to go back down that companies will start to do things to say, okay, this is, we're going to adjust things, and we're, we're going to adjust our future strategies to include this social cost. What the real social cost is, is hard to say, because it's a technical thing having to do with what's called a discount rate. So I'm going to take 10 minutes, 10 seconds to describe what discount rate is. <laughs> Have a hunk of money, $100. You can buy something now, or you can put it away and it can grow in interest at let's say two or five percent in interest, you know, safe interest, okay? So, so this hunk of money you spend today could be used later when the technology gets better and you have cheaper solutions and it could be better worth it, but that money grows in value. So there has to be a way of saying if you're gonna spend the money now or you're gonna spend the money 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 yeah. years from now. Discount rates are typically 40 years, 50 years. They are never 80 years, 100 years, 200 years. So in the lowest discount rate that economists would consider, you've discounted the future to zero by the time you're 75 years. But the worst of climate change occurs in 100 years, 200 years from today. So you're just essentially saying, hey, what happens to 150 years from today? It's discounted to zero. That's someone else's problem. And so that economic model actually sets the cost of carbon. And that, that's the thing, because we're in new territory. Nowhere in the history of human civilization 
has science said, what we're doing today is going to make things very bad 100 and 200 years from today. Never was that message ever delivered. And so we have our th ability to think goes by, I don't know, evolution. So we have Paleolithic brains, and we have modern dilemmas going, moving at light speed. And we have this climate thing now moving at, in, at, on geological time light speed. You know? And if we don't do something, if we don't get to zero emissions in 50, 80 years, the technical term physicists use is we will be in deep doo-doo. Okay? And so we need the price. And we need it soon, sooner rather than later, and it has to be high enough. Whether it's $100 or $200 a ton, everything will work. <laughs> $100 a ton, in my mind, is marginal. Hi, Dr. Chu. Thank you for your presentation. Um, several labs have used your techniques uh, built off of optical tweezing technology to understand the mechanical properties of molecules, stretching molecules of DNA and the like. And my question was, um, in biochemistry, we often learn about how enzymes work by applying mechanical stress or torsion to molecules to turn them from substrates into products. And I was wondering if any research has been conducted on using optical tweezing or light-based manipulation of molecules to catalyze certain reactions. Well, um, let me start by saying the very first optical tweezer work, uh, DNAs, uh, and things, well, that was actually my lab, but I also helped make the first measurements if a single molecule of a muscle molecule contracts, you pull the other way and you can measure the force that's generated when you burn one ATP. So by the early middle 90s, that became a huge cottage industry. And, and actually, about three or four years ago, Art Ashkin, who started playing around with the bacteria, got another Nobel Prize in physics for his biological playing around with bacteria and, um, and the single molecule work, um, which um, uh, I was very much a part of, but I already had a Nobel Prize, so I was very happy that art gets a Nobel Prize. Uh, so those things are a mainstay in biology today, uh, and it's part of my own research. Uh, now, if you ask to the, your question, can you use light to catalyze something? Uh, yes, you can, but that's a very expensive thing to do. When you talk about really, if you want to understand the science and everything, Yes, that, and that's what we do do. But if you want to actually use, do this to make something useful in some quantity that would be, help solve an energy problem, I, I don't think so. You know, these molecular motors that I study and other people have studied uh, are about 50% efficient at burning chemical fuel into making mechanical motion. They're more efficient than a diesel engine, okay? by burning ATP uh, and, and your brain in many respects works better in certain things than the biggest supercomputers we have. And it's like depending on how much you, know, you work is 20 to 40 watts <laughs> instead of hundreds of megawatts. So, so these are some of the things of the frontiers of which you would want to do, but I don't think we can harness molecular motors to power airplanes or automobiles. Uh, it just... <laughs> but, but we can understand biology in a very deep way, and that could be useful in many, many things, including medicine. Thank you both for uh, taking the time that I'm here. Hi, uh, for taking the time to speak with us. Um, you've talked today about uh, various sources of energy like solar and wind, as well as obviously oil and natural gas. Uh, I'm curious where you see, uh, or if you see, nuclear energy as a viable means, uh, you know, presumably fission, but you know, also future technologies, right, the fusion, uh, in terms of how they can be integrated as part of the energy mix in the United States in 
assisting right. our it, or yeah. globally. And yeah, the great cost question. And how that works. So, let's. For those of you who don't know, California is now 70% carbon-free uh, energy, 70%. And we have huge problems with energy storage because when during new time, we have an abundance of uh, solar. And we're starting to throw away more and more power, just throw away, warm up the ground, uh, because we don't know how to store it. And then as the sun sets about 3 o'clock, you know, you're, the ramp up need in California is going is going to be many gigawatts per hour ramp up, and so this is an unsolved problem, and and also it will come times in not only in California but other places around the world. The sun doesn't shine for days, weeks. Wind doesn't blow for days, weeks, and. We only have battery storage for partial daylight, three-hour shift. We're a couple hours of magnitude away from energy storage for three days. And it's got to be three times cheaper than it is today. Three to ten times less expensive. To be competitive with what? With natural gas. You have natural gas. It's sitting under the ground. It's sitting in gas well. You want power. You turn it on. You've run out of batteries. Right, or there's a water shortage, you, no more hydro. You gotta turn on something. So the competition is natural gas, let's assume coals for many, many other reasons is gone. Uh, so it's natural gas or nuclear fission. Um, there are natural gas generators that are only used five or 10% of the time. And they s still can make a profit because they are emergency generators from those very hot days where the price of electricity is maybe 100 times more. The power companies are willing to pay 100 times more than they're usually willing to pay because they're desperate. It, it, this, is just, this is what I call the short hair price. Uh, you know, the generators got you by the short hairs. <laughs> You're about to turn off the lights everywhere. You, you, know, you pay me 100 times more. So those things work. Because a lot of the cost of natural gas generation is the cost of natural gas. The generator is pretty inexpensive. Not true with nuclear. But you can have something different. And I'm advocating you have small modular reactors, mass produced. But suppose it's still going to be very expensive. 5% of the time, they're like natural gas generators. What do they do the rest of the time? They make hydrogen. They desalinate water. And this dual process, they have to be used 100% of the time, but because we are going to transition in part, some part, to hydrogen through electrolysis, and we will need desalinization more and more because we're running out of fresh water, I see this as the market. And, and so that's carbon free. Now, you just have to get people to say, you know, which is better or which is worse, natural gas and carbon storage or nuclear. The amount of waste disposal is like, it's not like night and day, it's like this much to the volume of this room. It, it's, it's like crazily different. And so there's also new technology. You can take these small modular reactors and after, you can make it into a battery and after 10 years, you take it and you put it in, in a hole with, that you drill and just dump it two kilometers deep and then it's gone in geological storage. So there's many technologies that are also being developed to take care of the spent fuel problem. And so I, I think that this may be a better solution than natural gas and carbon capture. Uh, fusion, uh, you, one shouldn't hold their breath <laughs> of commercial fusion. I, I just don't think it's, uh, I, I, it's more likely to have a, a battery that's 100 times cheaper than fusion. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm a big advocate of uh, uh, re-looking at fission. One final thing, I, um, it's the danger of radioactivity. It's well documented that the amount of deaths caused by burning coal, oil, or even wood is thousands to hundreds. Burning wood pellets is 100 times more dangerous than nuclear power, including Chernobyl and Fukushima. It's, 
uh, nuclear power is safer than wind. Uh, only slightly safer, but wind and solar and nuclear power are hundreds of times safer than burning wood pellets. Uh, or hydro, dams break and people drown. So, so it's, safety is not the issue. And if we can figure out how to deal with the spent fuel, that's no longer an issue. And so people just have to get, uh, you know, it's, it's the lesser of two evils. Well, there's a third choice, turn off the lights. <laughs> I think we'll have time for two more questions. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I had two quick things I wanted to ask you about. Um, we live in a very computationally heavy world where our data centers are drawing more and more power. Um, I was curious about what you thought about data center power consumption and how we can solve that. Um, and then the second part of my question is relating to how we can achieve a smart grid future. Yeah, uh, well, the first point, I agree with you, it's uh, like 5% is going to go to double digits, fraction of electricity. And, um, and, and we're not going to turn our backs on this stuff because computers and machine learning and all these other things give us a lot of things we have gotten used to. Um, uh, so what is happening is people are looking very hard at uh, really transforming the electronics. You know, we're kind of entering the end of Moore's law and going into three-dimensional so-called Fingate transitions and all these other things, and, these, um, and it's still going to get better and better. But there's other things on the horizon. There's electronic based on ferroelectrics that could be 10 or 30 times less energy intensive, but still in, could be made in this nanoscale. Uh, structures. So those are things, but in the end, we also have to be careful about how we use this computational power. I personally think that this crypto stuff is crazy. <laughs> They're using huge amounts of electricity uh, to make currency that's first application was money laundering. So, <laughs> so I'm thinking, <laughs> get rid of cryptocurrency. <laughs> but, 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 but those things are going to be an issue, and people ha are, are very aware of it. It was also an issue, even when I was Secretary of Energy, that the energy used for internet communications and cell phones was also going to go to double digit. And they made things hundreds of times less energy intensive. And so what happens? People just go to higher bandwidth, <laughs> right? And you know, 5G technology uses actually a lot more energy. And so we, we have, at some point, there has to be some, something. But you know what? With the proper price on carbon, some of these things get fixed, <laughs> right? You put a proper price, and, and then you think twice about just, you know, unlimited amounts of uh, energy. Well, the, the last, there is one last question. I think we have a couple here, yeah. but we can, I think we can only take okay. one more, but here I, there is Tamri, I think. Uh, okay. uh, hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I was just wondering if you had any advice for people from the world of science and engineering who are thinking about trying to make an impact in the world of government and po public policy. Yeah, uh, well, my advice is uh, try to get hired as Secretary of Energy. <laughs> no, I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. Um, I think uh, there are programs available. Uh, when I was the president and chair of the AAAS, we, there's these science fellow programs. Unfortunately, they're small. There's a couple hundred of them, and it's very competitive. Uh, these are policy, these are people who are in science and technology, graduate students, postdocs, they're embedded in agencies and, and even more importantly, in, in congressional offices. So many of the decisions that uh, policymakers have to make and vote on are technical issues. And most of the politicians, virtually all of them, are not scientists. So, so if you have someone who's trained in science and they're in those offices, they can be a conduit of information. Now, a young scientist, or even an old scientist, doesn't know everything. But what one does know is you can have friends 
who have friends, and you're one to two phone calls away from getting the expert. Okay, even if you're a young scientist, you're at most two phone calls away from finding out the real expert on this or that topic. And so that enables you to tap into this storehouse of knowledge that uh, a lawyer, uh, for example, would not. Uh, you know, a typical person in Congress doesn't have this background, so they don't have that set of friends and acquaintances that can help them find the right answer. And so I think more than anything, um, all, many of the decisions that society faces is needs this scientific input. And, and so, you know, I wish that there would be more Obamas or at least more people who would hire scientists in cabinet level positions. Okay, so I was the first in any cabinet. Oh, and and that was that just that's a testament to him, not me. <laughs> uh, and and so, if there are people who are at the big person table, it's a very different thing than being twice removed. Uh, and it's very different. The head of the NSF, the head of the NIH, that's not head of NASA. Those are not cabinet level positions. There are a couple levels down. And, and so, uh, so, you know, one hopes you out there who vote, tell, tell you your, especially if you're, in, you know, out of state. <laughs> California is, <laughs> is okay. But <laughs> if you're out of state, you know, tell your representatives and senators, you know, get some scientists into their offices. Right. And Steve, if you, if you don't mind, I will take one more question. I, th I think there's a student here who really, yeah, was patient, so thank you. Thanks so much for the very interesting uh, conversation. Um, so to begin with, it really concerns me that no fossil fuel company is aligned with the Paris Agreement. It concerns me that 40 years worth of climate disinformation funded by the fossil fuel industry seems now to be just transformed into greenwashing. And it concerns me that if all of the recoverable reserves that we have of oil are burned, we're going to reach over 8 degrees Celsius of warming, um, and they're very profitable. And it concerns me that Stanford is partnering with many of these fossil fuel companies. Um, so from your very extensive experience, what actions do you think we should take at Stanford and at the national scale to ensure that there's no more delay in the very fast clean energy transition that we need to have? Well, first, let me just say that not all fossil fuel companies are the same. Um, and I think that even today, there is some greenwashing going on with some of these companies. Um, but also, there are other companies who are actually diverting their major investments into non-fossil fuel. And you know what happened in the last couple of years? The analysts in Wall Street said, you know, they're mostly in Europe, because there's more political pressure in Europe to, to do something about the climate. That, uh, so this is BP and Shell and places like that. They, their stock was tanking, because the analysts in Wall Street said, you know, ExxonMobil, you know, they're, they're making more profitable investments. And so, so this is horrible, right? that companies that wanted to do the right thing, their stock begins to go down, and then they're saying, okay, well, what happens now? And so it's complicated. If you look at the companies, I would say my view is, my personal view is look at where they're making their investments. If they're making 5% investment in alternative energy, that's not real. But if they're being made 10, then 20, then 30, then 40% investment, that's real. And if they have a plan to offload new investments in fossil and find something else, that's real. If they're making more investments in finding more oil and gas reserves, then they're still using the old business model. This is how we make money. And so I think Stanford has to figure out what's going to happen. Now, having said that, these companies have the most expertise and how to sequester carbon dioxide. Because they use carbon dioxide to get oil. 
And that technical basis is something we desperately need. But I, I would agree, and I feel very strongly, that if the oil companies continue to drag their feet and make money the old-fashioned way, we're, we're, we have a big problem. And I think you know, we at Stanford have to try to discern you know, who, who are the people trying to make a difference. Now, in the end, typically, most companies go out of business when their business disappears. Very rarely <laughs> does a company truly reinvent themselves. Oh, so. Now, the oil and gas business, in my opinion, better be close to have disappeared by the last quarter of this century. I would hope by 2050, but it's not going to happen. But by 2080, if we're using anything close to what we're using, we've got a real problem. Okay, so again, the time scale, the transition, which is history, it says that, you know, yeah, if we move as fast as we can, I think we can do it in 50 years. We will not be able to do it in 20 years. And, and so we're not going to be zero emission by 2050. No, no policymaker, no company actually has a really credible plan to get there by 2050. Uh, and the, what I w first want to, as honest policymakers and honest companies, is say, we're making investments. We don't have a plan. We're not going to use vegetable oil to make airplane fuel. That is not a credible plan. <laughs> That's a, right? It's, it, it, there's not enough land. And also grow food for people. It just doesn't work. So don't look, don't look at vegetable oil. Okay, lots of ads about algae, but it's not working yet. <laughs> so, so, um, so I'm at the end, you know, I'm beginning to spend more and more of my cycles trying to figure out the food problem, the N2O problem, and the sustainable aviation fuel problem. Because these are, these are things we have no solution, but we need them desperately. Okay, but, um, you know, I share your frustration, but, but also, there's, you know, there's some companies trying. I wish they would show more cards. Oh, do you have any friends in Wall Street? <laughs> the analysts saying, <laughs> buy this company stock and that. Change that, <laughs> right? The, the analysts in Wall Street uh, don't have anything, you know, the morality of the situation doesn't feed into what they give advice on. And that's, a darn shame, right? It should. And so there's another thing. If you guys, the students here and the young people here who are idealistic, you got to change that too. The whole business community has to change. Professor Steve Chu, thank you so much. Thank you.